So it's a pleasure to be here. It's very nice to have an audience with wine, and I figured I should um, <laughs> have a glass of wine myself. Um, it's always great to give an evening lecture, and uh, I used to work very close to here in, at UCL for many years, and I had lots of colleagues at Birkbeck College, so it's great to be uh, back in central London from the far outreaches of England, uh, <laughs> and Cambridge. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about frontiers of machine learning and AI. Um, just a little bit about what kind of what I'm doing. I sometimes describe myself as being in a superposition state, if you know quantum theory. So I'm a little bit in Cambridge and a little bit in San Francisco all the time. Meaning like my evenings, sometimes I'm in San Francisco and during the days I'm in Cambridge you know, virtually uh, one way or the other. Um, but uh, the field that I've been working in is machine learning and, and AI in general. And uh, let's just start. Um, there are many terms that get thrown around. Um, machine learning is the term that I'm sort of um, most kind of uh, familiar with or attached to, but really, um, I didn't actually even relate to this term until um, a number of years ago. Um, there were other terms that people were thinking about in the 80s when I got into the field. Neural networks were very popular. They've been long forgotten now. <laughs> Nobody talks about them. Um, AI kind of came and went in popularity, data mining, deep learning, data analytics, data science, pattern recognition, all these terms have come and gone. Um, and you know, they're all closely related. There are also many traditional disciplines that are related to the field of machine learning. Um, apart from Carnegie Mellon University, where I spent about 10 years part-time, um, you will not find a department of machine learning anywhere. I'm really impressed with CMU that they actually set up a department of, of machine learning about 15 years ago. Um, but you will normally find things like departments of engineering or statistics, applied mathematics, economics, and so on. And all of these fields um, relate to machine learning as well. Um, so I'm now borrowing a figure from my colleague Rich Turner um, because he did a wonderful job. It's a busy figure, but there's a lot of useful information here. So just a little bit about terminology because people can get very lost in terminology. Um, so in this figure, what we have on this side are theoretical foundations, okay, the underpinnings of this general area, whatever we want to call it. And uh, statistics figures very prominently here. Statistics is the mathematics of learning from data, basically. So this whole field is related to things you can do with data. So statistics lives here. Machine learning also lives I would say on the theoretical foundation side of things, along with you know, other areas like signal processing, deep learning, which is really a subset of machine learning, etc. And what distinguishes these isn't any hard boundary, but it's a bit of a style of the kinds of things people do. And to stereotype, um, statisticians will often uh, look at simpler models with fewer parameters, but with much stronger theoretical guarantees, whereas machine learning people will often look at very complex models with many parameters for which there is uh, very little that you could theoretically guarantee. So again, everything here is a gross generalization, but I think it's still useful. Now, if we switch to this side of the figure, um, we can look at downstream application areas. And here, um, the question that's interesting is what motivates people? So some people are motivated by um, data extracting value or knowledge from data. So we live in this information revolution, everybody is awash in data, we know there's value in that data, and the fields of research that are trying to extract value or knowledge from that data are fields that you could call you know, data mining or data science, or even just science itself. I mean, science itself is about understanding from data. And um, you know what people tend to do is they might ask some questions, and they collect the data to answer those questions. Or in data mining, they might first have the data and then try to you know, come up with the questions afterwards. 
And then in purple here, again, it's just really a question of um, uh, a very blurry boundary between motivations here. Rather than extracting value from data, um, there is another group of people that is trying to recreate intelligent behavior of some kind. Okay, so areas like computer vision, speech processing, you know, robotics, autonomous systems, natural language processing, all of those relate to using data to recreate um, intelligent behavior, whether it's human behavior or not. Um, but the underpinnings are all the same, basically. And there really isn't anything, you know, and there aren't any hard boundaries in any of this space. When AI was very popular, uh, sorry, when AI was very unpopular, nobody said that they were working on AI. Now everybody says they're working on AI, even if what they're doing is trying to detect whether your credit card transactions are fraudulent or not, which people have been doing for 25 years, okay, and not calling it AI. Okay, so don't be kind of fooled or confused by any of the terminology. It's all one big mess, basically. <laughs> okay, so um, the key ingredient, sort of, it's a mess, but there is some essence to it. So I want to extract the essence in one slide. And to me, the essence are these five ingredients. Data. Okay, basically none of this stuff really works without some sort of data. Um, a model, and a model is what you use to take your data that you've observed and make any predictions or anything else from that data. Prediction, so what do you want to do with your data? You don't want to just look at your data, you want to do something with it. You want to make <coughs> predictions about data you haven't observed, future data perhaps, and you want to make decisions, right? You want to build maybe automated tools to make decisions. And maybe you want to gain some understanding, although understanding is much harder to quantify than predictions and decisions. Okay, so to me, these are the five key ingredients that underlie this whole mess here that people call AI or machine learning or data science. Okay? Okay, now, um, it's an incredibly exciting time for this field of AI and machine learning. And it's sort of, um, you know, it's taken the the people in the field by surprise. You know, sort of, if, if you can imagine a surprise that lasts for 10 years, for the last 10 years we've just been continually surprised by, you know, the, the, the rate at which things are changing, the amount of excitement in this field. Um, and it's exciting for some of the reasons that you're all aware of. We've had a lot of interesting breakthroughs, for example, in AI and games. You know, from our colleagues at DeepMind, again, I remember when I visited the DeepMind headquarters, which was a little office off of Russell Square. Um, this was when it was a little startup. Um, and they were already working on things like um, getting uh, AI systems to play Atari games, for example. So they had breakthroughs in Atari games, they moved on to Go. Other teams around the world have um, tackled uh, other interesting games like poker, poker is a particularly interesting game because unlike Go, it's a game of incomplete information where it's a psychological game, you kind of have to play against other people's sort of, you know, fears and so on, and to win you have to be able to bluff. So when computers beat humans at poker, which they have, there are actually computers out there that are extremely good at deceiving humans already. But that's the nature of the game. So we might take it for granted, or we might think, oh my god, computers are deceiving humans. You win at poker. You could take it either way. Now, on to things that are like, um, you know, more directly commercially useful um, and impactful. Uh, you could think about applications of AI and machine learning across a whole range of areas from speech and language technologies. Uh, you know, translation systems, question answering, computer vision, object face and handwriting uh, recognition, the sciences, you know, analyzing large amounts of data from biology, astronomy, and other fields, all recommender systems out there, self-driving cars, I'll say a few more words about that later, but, you know, certainly something that is going to have a massive impact on society, uh, finance, um, and actually, this is just six sort of areas I could fit on one slide, but you know, I could have had two or three slides like this with other areas that are being impacted by applications of AI and machine learning. Now, 
Um, the field of machine learning, and I'm going to focus in more on machine learning per se, um, the field of machine learning um, has, again, within it a huge mess of different techniques. There are many methods for uh, learning patterns and data and making predictions, and, um, you know, I sort of uh, quickly put them down in a, in a figure here. There's nothing really sacred about any of this except to say there are different camps within the field, you know, people who work on neural networks and deep learning, for example, people who work on like more statistical models, uh, people who work on decision trees, random forests, graphical models, causal methods, probabilistic methods, etc. One thing to take away from all of this is um, many of these areas are very closely related to each other, so although people get, you know, trained on a particular method, often they um, would benefit from understanding how closely related it is to other methods. So all of these things are sort of, again, very closely related. These are all the blue arrows. And also that, you know, if you go out there and you try to read papers in the field of machine learning, it quickly becomes very confusing because essentially every paper is proposing a new method, right? So you just have, let's say you have a problem, you just want to solve this problem. You know, there are 10,000 papers out there, there are 10,000 methods that are being proposed for solving problems, and really your biggest problem is you don't know which of those 10,000 papers is actually relevant to what you're trying to do um, versus which ones are not. Okay. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on this bubble here, the neural network and deep learning bubble. And the reason for that is um, because it's just been uh, one of the major drivers of the recent revolution in AI and machine learning. And, um, you know, you will have people basically at this point conflate the term deep learning with AI or machine learning um, or even uh, to the extent of like claiming that deep learning is going to solve all the problems of AI. So I want to focus in on that. There's been a huge amount of excitement there, but what is it? So, um, a slightly technical slide, but hopefully um, we can get through it. So uh, <laughs> deep learning is basically a, um, uh, a rebranding of a rather old idea called neural networks. And neural networks are an idea that um, were very popular when I got into the field in the, in the mid-80s. Um, Alberto, who I know very well, was also sort of bitten by the neural network bug around <laughs> the same time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the basic idea of a neural network, kind of the, um, the story that you get in the press is um, AI systems that are inspired by the brain, okay? The story I'm going to tell you is a more boring story. And the more boring version of that story is a neural network is a way of mapping from some input to some output, okay? The input could be an image, and the output could be a label for that image. And what a neural network is, is a tunable nonlinear function with many parameters. It's a nonlinear way of mapping from images to labels or whatever the input is and whatever the output is. And um, from a statistician's point of view, then there is nothing really weird or mysterious about neural networks. It's just, they're just nonlinear functions. They're nonlinear functions which have some parameters. These are called weights, or we can call them theta in our notation here. Um, the <laughs> simplest uh, neural network in the world is this neural network with one neuron where sigma is some sort of nonlinear sigmoid function. It takes a linear combination of the inputs and it maps them through some nonlinearity. A little bit like what a neuron might do, but a lot also like what logistic regression, which is, you know, a, 70 or 80 year old idea in statistics does. Okay? So that's a simple neural network. And what makes neural networks more interesting, maybe, is that instead of mapping in one shot from the input to the outputs, you have layers, and you think of the function that maps from the inputs to the outputs as a composition of functions. So here is a two layer version of that. I've just written it out in sort of detail where you have two layers of operations, um, theta 1, theta 2, mapping from x to y, and you can generalize that. Now, the way neural networks are trained is 
by minimizing some error or some loss on the output. And generally, those errors or losses correspond to maximizing likelihood, which is a well-known concept in statistics. And the way that that likelihood is maximized is through an algorithm called stochastic gradient descent, or variations of that. And that's a basic algorithm from optimization. So from this point of view, a neural network is not something to do with the brain. It's just a nonlinear function, which are um, using a bit of base, basic statistics to fit to data, using a bit of basic optimization. Okay? And so that's the neural network. Well, why is it so exciting? What's happened? Um, well, one of the things that's happened is, as I mentioned before, um, the field of neural networks, which you know, many of us were involved in in the mid-80s and early 90s, and it didn't really do amazing things back then, has started to do amazing things. And at the same time, a few people, uh, including the Jeff Hinton, who both Alberto and I worked with, um, decided to rebrand the field. It was just the most clever bit of scientific branding that I've ever seen. <laughs> they rebranded it deep learning. And sort of, uh, you know, that term never appeared in the literature before a certain date. And these systems are essentially the same as the systems that we had in the 80s and 90s with a few differences. So what are those few differences? Well, one of them is, of course, like any field of science, people have some, had some new ideas. So there were some architectural and algorithmic innovations. In particular, there were um, approaches to um, getting it to work with deeper architecture, so more layers. So let me be clear again, sorry. Here we have the image, here we have the label. We're trying to map from the image to the label, like for example, boat or something like that. And there are multiple um, levels or layers of processing that go on between the raw pixels in the image and the words in the labels. Okay? And so if it has more than one layer in the middle, you can call it deep. Okay? So the deep is just related to the, the, the number of steps of processing that happen from the input to the output. Mm -hmm. And how does it actually work? Again, just to be clear, the way it works is at the beginning, it takes the image in this case, and it just produces random outputs. So it's constantly making mistakes. And then what the algorithm does is um, every time the system makes a mistake, it takes that mistake and it propagates backwards through the network, small changes in all the connections in the network, so the next time around on that same image, it would be less likely to make a mistake. Okay? And if you do that over and over and over again, uh, hundreds of thousands <coughs> or millions of times, what you'll find is it stops making mistakes on, generally on the data that you've trained it on, and moreover, on new data, it tends to generalize well. Okay, that's the interesting bit. That on an image that it may not have seen before, it actually produces a sensible answer. Okay? So there were some architectural and algorithmic innovations, but probably the biggest driver of the deep learning revolution has been the fact that we can now throw much larger data sets at them. If you have a thousand images, you can't really do very much. But if you have a hundred million images, with corresponding labels that humans have labeled, just because, like, for example, on websites like Flickr, people like to put words that are associated with the image. So they produce, they produce data on the web for you. So then you collect a, you know, 10 million or 100 million images, you throw them at a neural net that doesn't know anything, and after you know, a week of running on a computer, um, it starts uh, mapping from images to text. Okay? And so we have vastly larger data sets, but along with that, we also have vastly larger compute resources, things like uh, graphical processing units on the cloud and so on. So you know, we can actually handle the data set. We also have much better software tools so that you don't have to redo everything by hand. You can just sort of um, plug and play with these software tools. Um, it lowers the barrier of entry for people getting into the field. And what uh, all of this resulted in was a few very, very interesting breakthroughs 
that vastly increased the industry investment into the field, the media hype, and the excitement from students. So many students come into the field, they say, um, I want to do a PhD in deep learning. And I say, well, do you know anything else about machine learning? And they're like, no, 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 I want to do, I know I want to do a PhD in deep learning. Because, you know, because a lot of these breakthroughs are associated with deep learning. Okay, so this is kind of what's happened. And, you know, I don't want to take away from the excitement. You can always go online and hear somebody like Jan LeCun give a talk about deep learning, and you'll hear a lot about the excitement of all the breakthroughs that have happened. But I'm going to be a bit of a downer. And what I want to talk about is that these deep learning methods do also have important limitations. So we've had all these breakthroughs. You know, people can pat themselves on the back. But what's next? What's sort of at the frontiers of this field scientifically? And um, <clears throat> let's see. Well, first of all, these methods are incredibly data hungry. Okay? Um, you know, humans are pretty lousy at many things, but actually we're pretty good at generalizing from a small number of examples. So, you know, if you give a child a few examples of, a, of an animal, they'll be able to generalize even to cartoon images of that animal and so on, which is pretty striking, actually. Um, and these deep learning methods are extremely data hungry. They often need millions of examples. And a lot of the breakthroughs, if you consider the breakthroughs from the world of games, games are great because you can generate you know, 80 million simulated games of Go, more than any <coughs> human being could play in their lifetime. And you know, basically, I mean, you're not brute forcing the problem because the problem is much bigger than that. But you're basically you know, extracting a huge amount of data from which you train your neural networks to solve that problem. But the real world isn't like uh, games and simulation. So sometimes we have to deal with small amounts of data, and we can't get around that. So another thing is that these uh, deep learning methods are very compute intensive to train and deploy. So people are spending regularly, you know, you know, thousands of pounds or tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds on some papers to produce the results in terms of that cost goes into compute um, power. And of course, if we want to deploy them on our mobile phones or something like that, you know, we don't want the, our vision system on the mobile phone to drain the battery within a few minutes, right? So we need to be mindful of that uh, compute intensity. And just as a point of reference, you know, one of, I, I would say the most remarkable <coughs> thing about the human brain is that it runs on 20 watts of power, which is a very dim uh, light bulb. Everything we do, you know, powered by 20 watts. Um, and, uh, you know, these go-playing computers, they'll, like, you know, they take whatever, a, a, a large amount of compute to to run that energy as well. Um, deep learning systems are poor at representing uncertainty. Um, they'll make predictions, but they will um, often give very confidently wrong answers. And that's quite worrying. Um, again, maybe if you're playing games, that's OK. But if you're in the real world, if you're making medical decisions or something like that, you don't really want to be confidently wrong. Okay? So it's OK to be wrong. Everybody should be allowed to be wrong. But don't be confidently wrong. Okay? Uh, so uh, the, another thing is that um, these systems, in these systems, it's very difficult to incorporate prior knowledge and symbolic representations. So um, a lot of the early history of AI involved thinking about symbolic reasoning and logic and so on. You have to really bend over backwards to try to get these things into our deep learning system. So that seems an interesting area to do research on. Deep learning systems are easily fooled by adversarial examples. I don't think I have an image of this, but it's really fun to see. I wish I'd put it in, actually, where you can take an image of a school bus. You can add small perturbations to the pixels. The, reg the original image is confidently classified as a school bus by the deep learning system. You add tiny, tiny changes to the pixels. Uh, and then it becomes, um, you know, confidently classified as an ostrich. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you could take actually any image of anything, just just perturb the pixels imperceptibly, and make the deep learning system say it's an ostrich. Okay, 
So these are what I call the adversarial examples. I invite you all to um, look these up. I'm pretty sure I don't have that slide here. Um, it's a shame. But uh, that's a problem. That makes you feel like they're, they're processing things in a very weird, unintuitive way, at least images. Deep learning systems are finicky to optimize. Um, that's a technical problem. You know, people can get around that. Um, they're generally uninterpretable <laughs> black boxes. They're lacking in transparency and difficult to trust. So again, um, for real mission critical applications where you really need to you know, understand why it's making a particular prediction, um, you probably want some sort of interpretability or transparency. Now, everything I've listed here, many, many people know, okay? And many people are actually working on these things. So it's not like, you know, uh, nobody's realized that these are problems. These are, these are the source of things people work on in the field to kind of go beyond deep learning. And in my particular case, the way I'm going to try to go beyond this kind of deep learning revolution is to go back to my roots, to go back to the sort of uh, underlying framework for thinking about machine learning systems. And that framework is a framework um, of probabilistic modeling. So the, the second word, when I was listing the key ingredients, I had data, model, you know, um, predictions, decisions, and understanding. Okay? So let me focus in on that second word, model. What do I mean by a model? We kind of all know what data means. Data is the stuff that you collect with some measurements. Okay? Um, a model, I would say, describes <coughs> data that one could observe from a system. Okay? So the point is, if you just have the data, you can't really do much with it. What you do is you take the data and you use it to build or update a model. And from that model, you make some predictions, um, some forecasts. <laughs> you, might as well gain, gain, you might also gain some understanding from that model. But let's leave understanding aside. Um, the quantifiable thing you can do with the model is you can make forecasts, like a weather model, a climate model, or a financial model whatever you model, a biological model. This extends not just to machine learning, but all of the sciences as well. A model describes data you could observe. So how do you know if a model is good or not? Well, you look at the data that it could generate, and then you assess, did that match the real data or not? Right? The real data I hadn't sort of used to build the model in the first place. And the process of making predictions on you know, fundamentally, it involves uncertainty, right? It seems weird to have a system that has predictions that is 100% confident. It has to have some sort of uncertainty. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the mathematics of probability theory to express all forms of uncertainty and noise associated with our model. So one tool for all forms of uncertainty, okay? And then it turns out that probability theory um, <coughs> if you just continue using it in the form of Bayes' rule, also allows us to infer unknown quantities, adapt our models, make predictions, and learn from data. Okay. So it's a, it's a jack-of-all-trades probability theory. It can do all of these things for you. It's the underlying mathematics of dealing with uncertainty, basically. Um, and how does this work in practice? Well, um, this goes back to Bayes' rule. Um, Reverend Thomas Bayes was a nonconformist English minister who was buried not too far from here. Um, and uh, he came up with Bayes' rule. Um, actually, Laplace came up with Bayes' rule, but you know, we're in England, so we don't really admit to that. Um, the French might want to call it Laplace's rule, but Laplace's rule is now used for something really trivial and, and, and silly. So we get to call it Bayes' rule. OK. So, um, so what does Bayes' rule do? Bayes' rule tells us how to turn our knowledge before observing the data into knowledge after observing the data. That's the basic idea of Bayes' rule. The knowledge before observing data is, I'm going to represent that with this probability distribution. It's a probability distribution over hypotheses. Okay? So that's what I'm going to call knowledge. It's a sort of state of knowledge, probability distribution over hypotheses. <coughs> but what do I mean by hypotheses? Well, uh, in the Bayesian world, there are only two kinds of things. There is data, which is what you measure, and there is everything else. 
okay? And you're allowed to have beliefs about everything that you don't measure. Before you observe the data, you represent your state of beliefs about everything you didn't measure, your hypotheses with a probability distribution. Um, fundamentally, this is a subjective thing. So different, you know, people can have different beliefs and they'll have different probability distributions. Of course, some will be better than others, like you know, an experienced meteorologist will have better beliefs about the weather tomorrow than I will have, right? So that's why I watch the weather on the news, because they'll know something that I don't. Um, but fundamentally, they represent beliefs about hypotheses with a probability distribution. Now, when the data comes in, what you do is you take each of your hypotheses that you're willing to consider, if it's a discrete set of hypotheses, you could just enumerate all of them. If it's continuous, you have to do some other fancy thing. <coughs> and you evaluate the probability of that observed data under that hypothesis. So how much probability was given to that data by that particular hypothesis? That's the likelihood. You multiply the prior by the likelihood, according to Bayes' rule, and then you renormalize so that things sum to one, because probabilities are meant to sum to one, summing over all hypotheses you are willing to consider, that's the H here, and what you get is the posterior distribution over hypotheses given data. And that transformation from prior to posterior is learning. That's what happens when you learn. Learning, in a lot of machine learning, if you go to any machine learning class anywhere on the planet, they will throw you into optimization. They will say, you have some parameters. What learning is, is you optimize those parameters to fit the data. Actually, that's like, you know, the, from a Bayesian point of view, that's chapter one of where education goes wrong. <laughs> you know, um, learning is actually, from my point of view, the um, transformation from prior to posterior through Bayes' rule. There's no optimization here. Optimization is a dirty you know, approximation or trick that, uh, that maybe approximates this um, transformation. That's sort of like a harsh view of, uh, you know, all of classical statistics from a very hardcore Bayesian um, mentality, okay? Of course, it works pretty well. When you do optimization, this works well. And all of the machine learning revolution has been based on people optimizing things to data. So you can't dismiss it completely. But theoretically, there's no reason why you would optimize anything. Okay. Actually, optimization does play a role. It plays a role later on if you need to make a decision. So learning is the process of going from prior to posterior. You've learned something about the world. Now somebody forces you to make a decision. Do you turn left or do you turn right? Do you buy this or do you not buy this, etc.? At that point, you optimize. You um, make the decision that minimizes your expected loss. This is rational utility theory. So for you know, the people from the world of business and economics, there is a whole theory for rational behavior where Bayesian inference comes in as like the calculus of learning, and then um, utility theory and decision theory comes in as, well, what do you do with that knowledge once you actually, you're actually forced to make a decision? Okay, so that's Bayesian inference in one, uh, one slide. And I'm going to just make sure I'm not running way over. So somebody stop me. This is a, for the computer scientists in the audience, this is an anytime talk. So anytime algorithms are algorithms where you can stop them at any point, and you know, hopefully you get something out of it. Um, so I'm happy to stop at whatever the end point is, and you know, hopefully we'll, we will have gotten through something interesting. Okay, so if I take Bayes' rule and then I apply it to the world of machine learning, then essentially, in fact, Bayes' rule itself is a corollary of the sum rule and the product rule, which, is these, which are these two more basic rules of probability theory. Learning is now in the language of machine learning. You know, Bayes' rule looks like this, where you have parameters of a model and you have your data and you have your model class. You just apply Bayes' rule to transforming from the prior to the posterior of parameters. Prediction is also a corollary of some rule and product rule when you want to make predictions about any unknown quantity x given your data What you're meant to do is average. That's where this integral comes from. Average over all your hypotheses 
weighted by the posterior that you computed here. There's no other way of doing it. This is sort of like, it's not arbitrary. It just follows from the sum rule and the product rule. Model comparison is also, um, you know, if I want to compare, you know, this model of the world and that model of the world based on some observational data, um, then, uh, you know, I would just invoke Bayes' rule at the level of models. So that's the general framework. Now, in this day and age where people have made so much progress, there have been so many breakthroughs by people who don't use the word Bayes anywhere in their machine learning papers. Um, you know, this puts me a little bit on the defensive. Where, well, why do these things matter? This might be all very elegant, but why do probabilities matter for AI? And so here on this one slide, I think I have a few reasons why I think it matters for AI. So one of them is that we want calibrated model and prediction uncertainties. We want to have systems that know what they don't know. A lot of these breakthroughs are in areas that don't really matter, okay? They don't matter to human lives and, and so on. When you try to deploy a system in a place that really does matter, whether it's a, a medical domain or a self-driving car, then you really do want a system that knows when it doesn't know. Another reason why Bayesian methods are interesting, I would say, is that they allow you to automatically control model complexity and structural learning. And I'll show a slide on that in a minute. Um, <coughs> We're trying to build systems that make rational decisions. So from the point of view of rational utility theory, you know, we should make best use of what we've understood the theory of, of rational behavior should be. Okay? So it just seems kind of odd given you know, half a century worth of people thinking about how do we design rational agents to have a whole field of AI that doesn't even know the basic you know, foundations of, of rational decision making and so on. Um, we want to have systems that <laughs> incorporate prior knowledge um, and we want to make sure that, that knowledge is updated in a coherent and robust way as you get more data. Okay? Um, you know, in many situations we have prior information. We don't want to throw just some amorphous neural network at the data and hope for the best, right? We want to actually incorporate the knowledge we've gained um, through experts, for example. And we want to make sure that our learning algorithms work on both small and large data sets. Almost all the breakthroughs that people are so excited about are breakthroughs because we have large data sets. Okay? Show me the breakthroughs of deep learning for the small data sets. You're not going to find them, basically. Because the small data sets are hard, the small data sets are the places where you might want to throw in prior knowledge, where you, your uncertainty does matter. And also, you know, a lot of the places that you think are large data sets are actually large collections of small data sets. So if you think about a medical domain, you might say, I have a huge data set, I have all the data of the NHS. But actually, <coughs> the data in the NHS is a huge collection of data sets, each of which is a single individual patient. And for that one patient, you might have just a handful of test results and recordings and so on. So for that particular person, that's a very small data set. And you better be careful what you're doing with that person's data if you're trying to make predictions. OK, so that's sort of why I think it still matters. Um, and just in terms of this question of Bayesian Occam's razor, um, so uh, uh, I've talked about automatic model complexity control and structure learning. And the simplest textbook example of this is um, fitting a polynomial to data. So imagine you have input and output uh, points here, these red dots, and I'm trying to fit this input output relationship, and I can fit a constant function, a linear function, quadratic, cubic, quartic, etc. And I only have eight data points. And with eight data points, it turns out with a seventh order polynomial, I can exactly fit the data. But you can see here that that seventh order <coughs> polynomial fits the red dots perfectly, but it's making these wild and wacky predictions, right? These um, interpolations that are completely nonsensical. So this is overfitting. We want to avoid overfitting. 
On the other hand, there could be some structure in the data, and if we just fit a constant, we may be underfitting. So we want to also avoid underfitting. So maybe the right answer is somewhere around here where we're fitting the data, but we're not overfitting and we're not underfitting. Okay? So that's model comparison or model selection, model complexity control. In the Bayesian framework, so here what we did is fit the best, optimize the best polynomial to the data. And we clearly, as we go more complicated, we can fit the data better. In the Bayesian framework, um, again, we don't fit things. We compute the distribution over polynomials given the data. So the green curves are uh, 20 samples from the distribution of constants or linears or um, quadratics or cubics, etc., given this data. And it gives you a sense of the uncertainty that you might have given the data. Okay, so we have some uncertainty here, uncertainty here. We even have uncertainty at this point. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of interesting things here. So the blue curves are the fit. The green curves are a sample from the Bayesian posterior parameters for a particular prior. I could have chosen a different prior. I would get slightly different results. But um, the qualitative aspects of this will not change that much. Now, uh, two things of interest. One of them is you clearly see that there is uncertainty. You don't get this weird <coughs> overfitting behavior. You just get like this cloud of uncertainty. Okay. And also, if you now compute the um, marginal likelihood, this sort of probability of the data given the model, you can actually look at that and it turns out, this is what's called Bayesian Occam's Razor, <coughs> it turns out that it tells you that constant, linear, quadratic, and cubic are all sort of sensible models for this data. Um, quadratic is the most sensible. The models out here, fourth, fifth, up to seventh order polynomials, there is some probability mass associated with those, but you can't really see them on this plot uh, because they're just overly complicated. And so it, this uh, marginal likelihood can be used to both avoid overfitting and underfitting. And none of this required any shenanigans. Basically, this was just following from the sum rule and the product rule of probability theory. Okay? <coughs> you know, nothing that wasn't known to Bayes in the 1700s. Okay, so this was kind of like, I I've, I've finished off, um, you know, a, a tour of the basics of the field. And in the last few minutes, and I know I'm going to be running out of time, I want to give you some vignettes of like what I think are the future exciting directions. And I'll spend a few minutes also talking about like, where does this fit into what I do at Uber? Okay. So current and future directions. A lot of what I do is motivated by this um, desire to automate machine learning. So machine learning is, an, it feels like it's a cottage industry right now where people are inventing all sorts of weird um, things and then, you know, hoping for the best. And I think if we go back to some principles, we can actually make it more scientific. We can automate stuff so that it even further takes humans out of the loop when it comes to learning from data. I want learning from data to be more of a systematic scientific thing <coughs> rather than an ad hoc thing that depends on you know, people's particular favorite methods. <coughs> I'm going to talk about three areas, Bayesian deep learning, probabilistic programming, automatic statistician. The Bayesian deep learning idea is actually a marriage of deep learning, which I've just described, with Bayesian methods. And one thing that I want to make clear and a lot of people don't really have clear in their minds, I think, is the distinction between um, models and methods. Okay? A neural network is a model. It's a sort of system that can make predictions. Methods are what do you do with those models when you have data. So you, know, you have optimization methods or Bayesian methods. So Bayes' rule falls in the category of methods. You can apply Bayes' rule to any model that you want, including a deep learning architecture. Okay, it's just to make that clear. So Bayesian neural network um, is just the neural network where we treat the parameters as um, things that we put 
prior distributions on, and then when we observe the data, we can try to compute the posterior distribution over the parameters. Um, this idea is actually rather old. In fact, it, in the early 90s, Radford Neal in his PhD thesis showed that a Bayesian neural network, um, with, when you have infinitely many hidden units, it converges to something called the Gaussian process. And what that did to many of us in the field is we said, ah, oh, great. <laughs> We can forget about these horrible neural networks and work on these beautiful Gaussian processes. So we just, as David Mackay said, maybe we threw the baby out with the bathwater because we just went after Gaussian processes, which are simple and beautiful, but we didn't really realize the potential of neural networks in other ways. Now we've just recently, this is a paper of ours, we've recently extended this result um, to show that uh, wide and deep neural networks also have this Gaussian process behavior. So many of the deep learning architectures, um, if you make them wide enough, they actually turn into Gaussian processes. So the trick is not to make them too wide, actually, in, in some ways. So that's an interesting result to think about. So the area of Bayesian deep learning is something that a lot of people have worked on, um, again, since the early 90s. <coughs> it's something that we're actively working on. <coughs> um, so there are a number of papers from you know, my, my group and my colleagues recently on this. And the point of it is nicely um, reflected in this figure here, which is imagine you're doing some sort of prediction where you have data, you're, you can afford to be fairly certain. Where you don't have data, you want to be uncertain. So this is this whole cloud of uncertainty that you might have. Um, and uh, we've been organizing workshops at, the, at this uh, main uh, NIPS conference um, that Alessandro mentioned uh, uh, in 2016 and 17, I'm hoping to organize another one this year as well. Um, we've done some interesting work. Again, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to rush through this. But we've done some work combining deep learning architectures with um, Gaussian processes, which are kind of related to deep learning architectures. And the point of this is we want to have the best of both worlds. I won't go into the details, but this picture is sort of interesting to think about. So look at this simple classification problem. I have yellow points and blue points. These are you know, measurements of something in two dimensions like maybe <coughs> images of you know, cats and dogs or something like that. And I want to be able to classify that classifies yellow from blue. Okay? Now, um, there are many ways of doing this, many ways that will work well. But what this picture is trying to make you focus on is far away from the training data. So let's look at what a neural network, a typical neural network will do far away from the training data. It classifies the yellow and the blue perfectly well. But when you go far away from the training data, it confidently labels points far away either blue or yellow or orange, whatever you want to call this. Okay? That's a problem. Like out here, if you query this neural network with a point out here, it should really say, I don't know. That doesn't look like anything in my training data. But no, it says orange, confidently orange. Okay? That's a problem. And if you take a good old-fashioned Gaussian process, all this white area is uh, probability 0.5. So that's, that's saying, I don't know. That's exactly the behavior you want. Except Gaussian processes are not that powerful in terms of modeling. Neural networks are quite good at modeling complicated things here. So you want the best of both worlds. And that this Gaussian process deep neural network, this is the behavior it has. It's actually quite good at modeling the data, it has all the power of a deep neural network, but also far away from the data, it will say, I don't know. And that's the thing we're aiming at. I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. So the second thing um, I want to talk about is this field called probabilistic programming. And the field of probabilistic programming is, a, is I think, one of these areas of really interesting frontier of, of machine learning and AI where um, we are trying to make the problem of building probabilistic models easy. Okay? So what's the problem? The problem is, you know, I've talked about how great probabilistic modeling might be, but deriving inference algorithms for probabilistic models 
is time consuming and error prone. It's a really difficult process. You might spend you know, weeks or months doing this manually. And um, that doesn't need to be the case. So the solution to this is uh, twofold. So what you have is a language, like a computer language, for expressing your probabilistic models. So mathematicians or statisticians like to express their probabilistic models by writing equations in a paper. But you know, um, generally, anything you can write as equations in a paper, you can write as a computer program. It's a probabilistic model. It's a computer program that calls a random number generator. So when you run that computer program, it generates data. Okay? And this is a well-known concept. That's the concept of a simulator. So many people have simulators, like you know, weather simulators or economic simulators or whatever kind of simulator you're interested in. And these simulators can be thought of as uh, models, maybe, maybe probabilistic models if there's, they, they call some random number somewhere, if there's some uncertainty somewhere. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use general purpose programming languages to define our probabilistic models. That's the, the first part. The second and maybe more exciting part is that um, given a probabilistic model or simulator, we can actually do automatic Bayes rule on those models. So we can say, here is our simulator. It would have generated, it, it would generate this kind of data. This is the real data I've observed. What should be the parameters of my simulator to match up to my real data? That's not about running a computer program in the forward direction. That's a little bit like running the computer program in the backward direction. You know what the answer should be? <laughs> what should the computer program have done to produce that answer? And it's not, uh, you know, it's not like a, it doesn't have to be logically exact because everything can have some noise. You're just getting a distribution over the random number calls in the computer program that are consistent with that real data. Bayes rule on computer programs. This idea is, again, not you know, totally new. I don't believe almost any interesting idea is totally new. In fact, um, there is a very influential probabilistic programming language in the statistics community called Bugs, um, pretty widely used. Uh, there is one developed by Microsoft over 10 years ago called Infer.net. Others, Blog, Stan, Church, Venture, Anglican, probabilistic C, etc. And my group has been working on two of them. Um, actually, my group in Cambridge is working on one called Turing, which is based on the programming language Julia. And the group at Uber AI Labs is working on a language called Pyro, which is based on PyTorch, which is a probabilistic, um, which is a framework for deep learning. So these are probabilistic programming languages. And under the hood, what they have is uh, algorithms like MCMC, particle filtering, variational methods, etc., that are automatically running. So that you just have to specify the model. Here's the picture. So, you know, what you do is you say, well, I want, you know, I have some data, I want to use a hidden Markov model. So you write down an expression for a hidden Markov model as a computer program. That's what it would look like in Turing. Um, and then you hook it up to the data, and then um, the inference engine will go and figure out what your hidden variables um, should have been. And uh, some people in the community, I really like this description, some people in the community describe it as the um, sort of what happened in computer science with compilers. So back in the bad old days, people had to write uh, programs in machine language. Then somebody figured out that you could actually come up with high-level programming languages and have a compiler that compiles from this uh, uh, kind of more abstract, higher level programming language down to machine level code. With probabilistic modeling, again, we're like in the, we're at the beginnings of the compiler world, where you can just write down a high level description of your model and let the computer do the hard work. Okay. And the third thing and last thing, and now I'm out of time, uh, I want to talk about is this automatic statistician, which is a, this system that tries to do AI for data science. And the need here, the idea here is that there aren't enough data scientists, statisticians, or machine learning experts out there, and there's a lot of value in the data that we have. And what our system tries to do is automate model discovery from data. 
And so again, I'm going to skip over a lot of this. Data goes in, it searches over models, it finds a good model using Bayesian Occam's Razor and all this stuff under the hood. And then, interestingly, what it does is it actually produces a report that tells you the patterns that um, have been found in the data. So it's the opposite of the uninterpretable, um, non-transparent thing. It actually tries to talk to you in English about what is discovered in the data. And these are like the first pages of the reports that it produces, and there are a lot of examples of this. So I think I'm out of time. No, no, please, please do overrun. I'm, I'm going to overrun by a, by, by a very few minutes because I'm going to switch gears and just tell you a little bit about kind of how this fits into my life now. So I, as I mentioned, I'm about to spend at least a year uh, at Uber in San Francisco. Uber is setting up an AI lab. Actually, we've had an AI lab for a year and a half that I've been helping run <coughs> from here. Um, and so what is AI at Uber? And a lot of people will think that what I'm talking about is self-driving cars. And actually, we have a, a huge effort in self-driving car, cars. We have hundreds of people working on self-driving cars. But that's a business division. <laughs> So they, they actually, you know, I work a little bit with them, but they're separate from us. So you can think of what our team is trying to do is everything else. Anything else that's AI related that's not self-driving cars. <coughs> so where is that? Well, you know, just background, I think AI is going to affect most aspects of our lives, including transportation. This is from our new CEO, Dara. Um, Uber is a giant machine intelligence problem, and it's a particularly challenging problem because we're trying to optimize and navigate the real world with all the uncertainty that that brings. So just a little bit about Uber. Um, it's, a pretty, uh, you know, it's a pretty global company doing lots of different things. 65 countries, 600 cities, over 3 million active drivers, 75 million monthly active riders, etc. And then, um, you know, also food delivery, freight, Uber Air, you should check out the videos of like, you know, our plans for flying people in and out of cities, um, should be fun, by 2023, um, uh, two or three million self-driven miles, etc. Um, so the AI problems that we look at are problems that involve modeling in space and time to make forecasts. So it's actually a really good place for probabilistic modeling. We use deep learning. Deep learning is useful as a tool, but we can't hit every one of these problems with just a bit of standard deep learning. So we do long-term forecasting, short-term forecasting, real-time forecasting, anomaly detection. Um, you know, these could be called traditional statistics if you want, or econometrics, or data science, or AI. It doesn't really matter, it's just what matters is are your forecasts good or not, basically. Um, we're forecasting, well, what are we forecasting? We're forecasting things like supply and demand. So, for example, what we'd like to happen is, you know, when you go out there and you open your app to call a car, um, we'd like there to be drivers right around where you are so that you know within a minute or two they show up and they take you wherever you want. Okay? So the only way we can do that is to try to predict how cities work, you know, how people work. You know, are they actually, you know, if there's an event, you know, at Wembley, what's going to happen? Are there going to be a huge spike in demand? If it starts raining suddenly, what's going to happen to the demand? All this stuff, you know, it's not just an app. It's actually a gigantic prediction engine that is trying to optimize this whole market. Um, so this obviously also goes into uh, pricing. So basically, if so, we have surge. Well, the point of surge is that there is a if there is a huge mismatch between price and demand, we have to do something to actually. What surge tends to do is just decrease the um, demand. Basically, if you say the price has gone up by fifty percent, a lot of people say, "All right, well, I'll walk or something." They'll, they'll try to find some other um, means of getting somewhere that um, makes the supply and demand equilibrated. Um, we're also trying to predict how long it takes to get from A to B. And that's not trivial, actually, because you know traffic and all sorts of conditions. Um, 
And you know, every second, every second of prediction accuracy that's improved provides value to you know the 75 million monthly um, riders that use it. Um, we even do things like, well, we have a foods business, Uber Eats, and we do restaurant dish recommendation. Again, a nice probabilistic modeling machine learning problem. We estimate time to delivery because time to delivery is quite complicated. It involves things like how long will this order of food actually take to prepare? <coughs> so we have a team that works on like modeling that. Okay, so machine learning for food preparation time. Okay. So of course we work on self-driving cars. Um, one of the most you know interesting uh, AI problems. Right now, we have this uh, electric urban aviation service that we're planning, and lots of other things. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over all of this. So, so I'm gonna end with a couple of thoughts. So these thoughts now go back to AI. So, what do we need? What principles do we need to build an AI system? Okay, so we need principles for perception, right? How do you perceive the world? We need principles for learning, we need principles for reasoning, we need principles for decision making. Now, I was at a big AI conference um, a, a few months ago. I asked this whole huge room, how many people think that we have the principles already? Nobody raised their hands. I was pretty shocked. Like, I think there were maybe over a thousand people in the room. Nobody raised their hands. And I thought kind of odd because I think we have the principles. I think we kind of have all the, the tools that we need to build AI systems. You know, we have nice ideas like we've got logic and probability theory, optimization, you know, these things like deep learning, Bayesian inference, Bellman's equation, game theory. Like we've got, you know, many decades of, um, of really clever thinking about how to design intelligent systems. The problem is actually being intelligent involves intractable computations. Like the amount of computation you need to do, like we know how to solve chess, okay? It's pretty trivial. You look through all the moves of chess and you figure out what the best moves are. Okay, that's the theory of chess. Same theory goes for Go. Same theory goes for poker, but with a little bit more you know, model of the uncertainty of the uh, behavior of the other agent and stuff like that. But none of it is, none of it to me seems, you know, outside of the reaches of our mathematical principles. It's just computationally hard. It just would take the lifetime of the universe to actually solve these problems. And so everything that I feel we're doing is coming up with approximations to what it means to build a rational system. And so the cleverness of the community is going into coming up with these fast approximations so we don't have to do all the computations that the exact solution would take. Um, so the last thing I'm going to say is societal impact. So, um, you know, everything in AI and machine learning, you know, the more I look at it, the more I see kind of all aspects of our life being affected by this. And it's not just doom and gloom, it's really about making things more productive and efficient, but that also means a lot of disruption. So disruption to employment, you know, the way healthcare is provided, cities and transport, there's a lot of real potential there, energy, climate financial systems, etc. And so it's worth the, for the AI community to kind of get outside its bubble and try to think about like what are the impacts of what we do um, and how do we steer it towards um, <coughs> positive things rather than more negative things. So I think I'll just end with that. Um, and uh, thanks for your patience. Yeah, thank you.